Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Uh, thank you all very much for coming out this evening. Uh, thank you for that kind introduction. And I'm, it's a real honor to be here uh, uh, to start off the 2013 Ronald Reagan Lecture Series, especially since uh, today is President Reagan's birthday. So a great, uh, a great opportunity. Um, and I'm delighted to see all of you here this evening, uh, since I'm sure some of you struggled through the same traffic that I did to get here, so I appreciate your, your diligence and, and perseverance. Uh, I wanted to talk tonight about the uh, international situation that the United States faces, what we've come through in recent years, what we face over the next uh, several years. Uh, and I think it's uh, very appropriate uh, on Ronald Reagan's birthday. As a great president, he faced extraordinarily difficult times internationally. And his policies ultimately, I think, uh, after he left office uh, and George H.W. Bush became president, resulted in the collapse of the Soviet Union, the end of the long Cold War struggle, uh, and the kind of victory that, uh, that he and others worked so hard for. You know, when Reagan was campaigning for president and then president, his critics like to say to him, you know, he's got a kind of simple-minded view of the world. He's not as smart as we are, of course. How can, this, uh, how can this former actor possibly be a successful president? Part of the reason he was successful is that he, uh, he could, uh, as Jim Baker always used to say, he kept his eyes on the prize. When asked how he saw the Cold War ending, he said, we win, they lose. <laughs> this, is, this is a concept difficult for our current president to grasp, unfortunately. <laughs> so, <laughs> it, this will not be a partisan speech. I just do objective analysis. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but I do think it's important as we look at the uh, United States in world affairs over the next several years to talk a little bit about where the, the mindset is in Washington because under our Constitution, the President is the dominant voice in the formulation of foreign policy. And so understanding what's been happening in recent years and uh, how we may uh, see the challenges ahead of us emerge and how we face them depend a lot on who's in the White House. This is why elections matter uh, so much. Uh, and, and it's uh, so with that understanding that I want to uh, run through some of what distinguishes uh, President Obama from his predecessors, and especially uh, Ronald Reagan, because it has made a difference in the past four years, uh, and for well or ill, it will make a difference in the next four. First is that uh, unlike uh, most of his predecessors, President Obama doesn't have any particular interest in foreign policy and national security. Now I know uh, I say that and people say, well, but he has to. Well, no he doesn't, except when he's confronted with it. His uh, second inaugural address was stunning in its lack of attention to international affairs and the challenges that face the United States. You know, most presidents, when they face a second term, they're lame ducks uh, because of the two-term limit. Uh, their interest in international affairs increases because of their flexibility and their influence. And at least so far, characterized, as I say in the inaugural address, that's not the pattern that the president's followed. He is focused on transforming uh, the country domestically. Second, he doesn't see the world as terribly threatening or challenging to the United States. We've seen this throughout his political career at the national level. He has tried not to talk about the global war on terrorism. In the 2008 election campaign, he said memorably, Iran is a tiny country. Uh, as if it's going to make tiny nuclear weapons, and, and, and therefore we don't have to worry about them. Uh, uh, his, his view of the uh, impact of declining American influence around the world is that it's a benign phenomenon. He's not troubled by it. He's not troubled by uh, decreases in our defense budget. Uh, he's really the first President, Republican or Democrat, since Franklin Roosevelt on December the 7th, 1941, to have a view that's so distant and remote 
from uh, the international environment in which the United States and its friends and allies have to uh, assert themselves. Now, in, in days gone by, a person with this approach would have been an isolationist, somebody who just said that I'm not going to pay any attention at all to the rest of the world. And I have to tell you, I am worried that here in the United States, because of the difficult economic circumstances we've had over the past four years, there is a growing current of isolationism, not, not in the Democratic Party so much, but in the Republican Party. And maybe we'll talk about that a little bit in the question and answer period. This is something that I worry about. Obama's reaction, though, not paying that much attention, not being that concerned, is not isolationism, it's multilateralism. The view that American foreign policy can safely be handled in international organizations uh, like the United Nations. And this is not uh, simply about international economic policy. It goes directly to the president's principal national security of function of keeping America safe in the world. We haven't seen much of a discussion of this in recent years, but if you go back uh, really just uh, uh, to the days of the Clinton administration when they were considering the possibility of an air campaign against the Serbs in Kosovo. Uh, they went to the United Nations Security Council to get authorization to conduct that campaign. It was clear that Russia would veto any Security Council authorization. And so the Clinton administration and our friends in Europe just decided that they would have NATO conduct the campaign anyway. Now, President Clinton was not criticized for that because that was deemed to be a good thing by uh, the, the national elites in this country, unlike the criticism President Bush faced uh, when he saw a Russian veto and a French veto potentially against overthrowing Saddam Hussein. But there were a lot of people in the world back uh, in the Yugoslav crisis who worried about the United States taking this action on its own, in effect. And indeed, the Secretary General of the United Nations said in 1999, and I quote, unless the Security Council is restored to its preeminent position as the sole source of legitimacy on the use of force, we are on a dangerous path to anarchy. And he then said later that uh, Security Council approval for the use of force uh, was something that went to the very core of the international security system. Only the UN Charter provides a universally legal basis for the use of force. Now, that's a view that no American politician <laughs> of any stature has yet been willing to express. But that was a view that the UN Secretary General felt no problem in saying at that time. Uh, and it's very reminiscent of uh, our new Secretary of State, John Kerry, who said back in his 2004 campaign that American foreign policy had to pass what he called a global test. Uh, meaning approval by the Security Council. So it's going to be extremely interesting to watch how this plays out uh, over the next four years. I, I think the way to understand President Obama best is to see him as the first post-American president, that he's gone beyond the narrow confines of being merely an American and that he has larger things in mind. Now, I think this is, uh, th this is best understood uh, as rejecting the concept of American exceptionalism, that we are, and we have seen ourselves, uh, as having a different historical experience, different foundations for our society and our government, uh, and, that, and, and that we have necessarily had a different role in the world than many other governments. Uh, this is something that, uh, that the people who founded the country saw right at the beginning. Uh, John Winthrop, the uh, first governor of the Plymouth Bay Colony, uh, quoting uh, scripture, said, we must consider that we shall be as a city upon a hill. Uh, and in fact, uh, Ronald Reagan, <laughs> one of the few politicians who can improve on scripture, liked to call us a shining city on a hill. 
uh, and, and it reflected his strong belief in American exceptionalism. Now, it's a controversial subject in much of the world. It's seen by our adversaries and critics as a form of uh, arrogance. I really don't think that's what it is. It's an assessment that we uh, have followed a different path in history. And the first person to use the term uh, actually was a Frenchman, Alexis de Tocqueville, who in, in his great work, uh, Democracy in America, said, the position of the Americans is therefore quite exceptional, and it may be believed that no democratic people will ever be placed in a similar one. And that, that was a very early assessment of the uniqueness of the United States and our history even to that point. Now, you'll notice in his inaugural address uh, last month, the president did talk about American exceptionalism. It's a, it's a skill he has of taking words and emptying them of their content and then filling them with the content that he wants to put in them. It's a great skill of the, the master 20th century propagandist. The president was asked on his first trip to Europe in 2009 by a British reporter if he believed in American exceptionalism. And this was his answer at the time. He said, yes, I believe in American exceptionalism just as the Brits believe in British exceptionalism and just as the Greeks believe in Greek exceptionalism. Now, let's parse that sentence. In the first third, he says, yeah, I, I believe in it. So all these uh, people who say I don't, they're wrong. I've just proven that. But in the second two-thirds of the sentence, he takes back what he said in the first third. You know, there are 193 countries in the United Nations. He could have continued that answer, just as the Papua New Guineans believe in Papua New Guinean exceptionalism, just as the Burkina Fasians believe in Burkina Fasian exceptionalism. You know, if everybody's exceptional, obviously nobody's exceptional. And I think that's, that's basically uh, his underlying approach. Uh, and it was fascinating to uh, listen to some of the comments that the news media made about President Obama's speech at the 65th anniversary of D-Day, the D-Day landing uh, in 2009. Uh, I think we all remember Ronald Reagan's speech at the 40th uh, anniversary of D-Day. So this was 25 years later. And one of the commentators was Evan Thomas of uh, Newsweek magazine, uh, a periodical I'd like, I, I like to say whose title is half accurate. Uh, <laughs> Evan Thomas uh, specifically compared the Obama speech to, to Reagan's speech in 1984. And this is what he said, Evan Thomas now. Well, we were the good guys in 1984. It felt that way. It hasn't felt that way in recent years. So Obama's had really a different task. Reagan was all about America. Obama is, we are above that now. We're not just parochial. We're not just chauvinistic. We're not just provincial. We stand for something. I mean, in a way, Obama's standing above the country, uh, above, above the world. He's sort of God. He's going to bring all different sides together. Now, apart from the reference to God, which is a little over the top, even for the mainstream media, that is, in my view, an accurate description of how Obama sees things. He is above the country. He is post-American. Now, he's not the first politician to hold those views, but he's certainly the first to be elected president. Back in 1988, George H.W. Bush, running to succeed Reagan, said of his opponent, Michael Dukakis, said Bush about Dukakis, he sees America as another pleasant country on the UN roll call, somewhere out there between Albania and Zimbabwe. And you could say the same thing about Obama. He's not anti-American, he's post-American. Uh, because all the 193 members have equal interest. Now, this is fundamentally about as different an approach to American national security from Reagan's as you can imagine. Reagan's view was, uh, in, it was complex, he confronted a number of challenges, but it was summed up in the saying, peace through strength. 
that the way to advance American interest and avoid conflict, avoid military hostilities, is to be strong enough that our opponents are dissuaded or deterred uh, from trying to take us on. That peace through strength uh, is the surest way to uh, protect our interest and keep the peace. Obama's view is exactly the opposite. He thinks that American strength is provocative, that we are too influential in the world, that we, our success has produced too much of a reaction against it. And so uh, a little American weakness uh, will simply uh, restore the balance uh, uh, that's appropriate in the world. Th this is just flatly wrong. It's like looking through the wrong end of the telescope. It's not American strength that's provocative. It's American weakness that's provocative. That says to our adversaries, we can take advantage of the Americans and they can't prevent us. And Reagan understood uh, fundamentally the relationship between the American economy, having a strong economy, and a strong presence in the world. Uh, and it's sort of ironic about Obama is that he's so focused on restructuring the economy, he doesn't understand uh, the international implications. Uh, and this is something that, that I think is important to understand, that a strong international presence uh, it doesn't mean a strong government at home. It doesn't mean higher taxes, more regulation, and more interference. Adam Smith, the, the uh, classic free market economist, said in The Wealth of Nations, the first duty of the sovereign is that of protecting the society from the violence and invasion of other independent societies which can be performed only by means of a military force. Reagan once said to Cap Weinberger, his defense secretary, that the defense budget is more than a budget line item. It is absolutely uh, critical to securing all of our other liberties. And he said uh, at one point, in recommissioning the famous battleship in New Jersey, he said, yes, the cost is high, but the price of neglect would be infinitely higher. And, and we can see Reagan's warning coming true today. In Reagan's day, different environment to be sure, he wanted a 680, he wanted a 600 ship Navy. That was his goal. Today we have a Navy of 285 ships. This is the smallest number of ships in the Navy since 1916. 1916, now this came up in the debates in the presidential campaign. And the president's reaction uh, to this figure was uh, snarky. He said, well, but our ships are very modern and much more modern than ships from 1916. Well, of course they are. Of course they are. And if, God forbid, they were ever in conflict, it may be news to the president, but they wouldn't be fighting ships from 1916. They'd be fighting ships that are, that are just as modern as, as ours are. The, the budget cuts we face, the ones that are upcoming, are going to be uh, devastating. Uh, now, people say, but we spend so much more than than, uh, than other militaries around the world, that our defense expenditures are bigger than the next 10 countries combined. And that's, that's true because our technology, the unmanned aerial vehicles, the drones, the communications, all of the things that we have uh, enable us to protect ourselves while minimizing the risk to our service members. Uh, do we have more than adequate defense capabilities e even today? Yes. Should we? Absolutely. Because I would uh, put it to you that we shouldn't ever want America to be in a fair fight. We don't want to be in any fights at all, but if we are, we want to win overwhelmingly. And that is the basis of peace through strength, that you're much more likely to be able to preserve the peace if it's clear that, uh, that our adversaries can't take advantage of uh, weakness. Now, let's, let's look at the environment we face internationally with that background in mind. Uh, you know, one of the, one of the, the main arguments that uh, the administration made when it came into office was it wanted to press 
the famous reset button with Russia. Uh, and they pressed it, and they pressed it, and they kept pressing it. Uh, they gave up uh, precious uh, assets in Poland and the Czech Republic for national missile defense because they fundamentally don't believe in national missile defense. They think it's destabilizing um, uh, to uh, prevent Russia from being able to launch a catastrophic first strike against the United States. I, I think history will show that it was Reagan's determination to proceed with the strategic defense initiative combined with other factors like falling global oil prices that finally put so much economic pressure on the Soviet Union that its internal contradictions caused it to collapse. Uh, it was Reagan's view that defense is a good thing and that protecting Americans from incoming nuclear-tipped ballistic missiles is a good thing. It's not a destabilizing thing. It's what government is designed to do, what I just read from Adam Smith, to protect the people from the violence of other societies. And that's why, uh, under the Bush administration, uh, we got out of the 1972 Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty so we could build a national missile defense capability. Not what Reagan had in mind, something much more limited to protect us from rogue states like Iran, then uh, Iraq, North Korea, who had the capability or were moving toward it uh, to, to have nuclear weapons not of the level of Russia or the Soviet Union during the Cold War, but a dozen, dozen and a half, enough to threaten us and our innocent civilian population so that they could blackmail us. The Obama administration, because of Russian expressions of opposition, has essentially uh, gutted the missile defense program. Uh, and so our ability to protect vital American cities and populations uh, is now gravely threatened. We gave the Russians another strategic arms control treaty, and, and the president apparently set on negotiating even lower levels of American nuclear weapons, as if it's our nuclear weapons that are the cause of instability in the world. Let's be clear, the American nuclear umbrella and America's strong conventional forces provide whatever stability and order there is in the world. There's certainly not enough of it, but it's because of us. And, and the notion that we will live in a safer world as we draw down our military capabilities flies in the face of reality. It, it is, this is, this is the argument over what's called global zero, that if everybody went to zero nuclear weapons, the world would be a safer place. And, you know, I'm sure in North Korea and Iran, uh, as they see the Obama administration reducing our nuclear weapons, that there are people rising all the time saying, well, if the United States is going down, what do we need a nuclear weapons program? <laughs> they're, they're the ones in jail, you know? That's, that's where you can find them. It's, it's an incentive for our adversaries, including Russia and China to build up their capabilities. And in fact, what the Russians are doing as uh, international oil prices remain high is that they are modernizing and expanding their conventional forces, they're redoing their ballistic missile forces, they're uh, modernizing and upgrade, upgrading their nuclear weapons capabilities while ours decline uh, uh, more and more. So that the reset button with Russia has not produced better relations. In fact, after four years, uh, Russian President Putin and his foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov, have both said, you know, we need a completely new policy from the United States. They took every concession made in the past four years, put it in their pocket, and are asking for more. Because they have sized up the administration, they see exactly the direction it's going in, and they're uh, graciously trying to help them along the path that they've already followed. Uh, and we face the same lack of strategic coherence when it comes to dealing with China. Uh, obviously, uh, a country that's had substantial economic success in recent years. Uh, but where we uh, adhere to a view, and, and it's true in the business community in this country too, that China is engaged in what they call a peaceful rise and that it will be a responsible stakeholder in world affairs. No, no problems there. 
Well, it's possible. That, that is a possible scenario for the future of China. I'd like to think uh, that, uh, that that's the direction they are going to go in. But it's not the only scenario for China, and it's not necessarily the most likely. Uh, in addition to its economic growth, uh, China has modernized its uh, very extensive conventional uh, weapons capabilities. It has substantially increased its nuclear forces and its ballistic missile uh, capabilities. Uh, it is building a blue water navy, uh, which will include aircraft carriers and submarines. Uh, really, for the first time in uh, five or six hundred years, that China has embarked on a major naval buildup. They have the world's most advanced cyber warfare capabilities. Virtually every major American company has been hacked into, and certainly the Pentagon and other government departments have been the subject of the attack. I mean, so uh, uh, industrious are the Chinese cyber warfare people that they've attacked the New York Times and the Washington uh, Post, although I don't know why particularly. Uh, <laughs> They, they have developed anti-satellite weapons, which uh, they understand would be critical to putting America's eyes in space out if they ever wanted to engage in conflict. They've developed uh, area denial and anti-access weapons to push the shrinking American Navy back from the western shores of the Pacific, where we've provided stability in East and Southeast Asia for the countries there to engage in trade and travel. Uh, they have made, the Chinese have made uh, assertive, even aggressive territorial claims in the East China Sea and the South China Sea to gain control over what are now international waterways and make them into Chinese lakes uh, and, and get in control of the undersea resources, oil and, and others that are believed to be present there. Uh, they pressed against the borders of their neighbors. Uh, the even, even India now sees China as a threat. Uh, and in response to all this, we've done next to nothing. Uh, we have no plan to deal with China. As I say, I'd like to believe that uh, China will engage in a peaceful rise, but that's simply a projection of the last few years of Chinese history. China is an ancient country. If you look at the last hundred years of Chinese history, it's been a century of turmoil and disruption, the fall of the last imperial dynasty, the establishment of the Republic of China, the first fall of the Republic of China, the warlord period of civil war in the 20s, the Japanese invasion in the 1930s, the brutal war between China and Japan through 1945, the civil war between the Chinese Communists and the Chinese Nationalists, the overthrow of the Republic of China, its escape to Taiwan, the establishment of the People's Republic, the great leap forward in the 1950s, the, the uh, single most devastating human economic decision in history, more people killed because of the great leap forward than any other human decision uh, in, in all of our history the great proletarian cultural revolution of the 70s that destroyed uh, so much Chinese culture and civilization, the massacre at Tiananmen Square in 1989, then followed by a few years of economic growth. So if you're going to project China's history, uh, don't just project the last 20 years, pr project the last 100, and you can see the future is far less certain, remembering that the People's Liberation Army remains the dominant faction within the Chinese Communist Party, and the Chinese Communist Party remains the dominant political force in China. All, all of which is going on while we're not paying attention at all. Uh, now that I've given you the, the good news about international affairs, <laughs> let's, let's turn to the Middle East. Um, you know, if you, if you listen to the Obama administration, as they like to say during the campaign, General Motors is alive and Osama bin Laden is dead, as if that's the end of the discussion. And, and you know, I have to say, public opinion polls uh, over the past several years rate the president very high in his conduct of foreign affairs, I think largely because of uh, the killing of bin Laden. 
But uh, I think we understand the search for bin Laden went on for 10 years. It was a huge effort. It took a lot of people working very hard before uh, the Navy SEALs were able to go into that compound in Pakistan and uh, do what was necessary. And for Obama to take credit for it or get credit for it, I like to say is a little bit like Richard Nixon in the summer of 1969 when Armstrong and Aldrin landed on the moon. Nixon saying, in my administration, we put men on the moon. When we all know that the program started 10 years before when John Kennedy said it would be our objective uh, before this decade is out to land a man on the moon safely and return him to Earth. Uh, so Obama was standing around when Navy SEAL Team 6 went in, and that was about all he can take credit for. Uh, in fact, uh, the, the idea that the war on terror is over, that al-Qaeda has been defeated, uh, while it may have been successful as a publicity uh, stunt during the campaign, uh, tragically was not true then, it's even less true now. You know, the president said on September the 5th last year in his acceptance speech that al-Qaeda is on the road to defeat. Six days later, in Benghazi, uh, al-Qaeda-affiliated terrorists killed Ambassador Chris Stevens and three of his colleagues. Six days later, and I think we've seen all across North Africa uh, the, uh, the impact of uh, the spreading strength of al-Qaeda uh, in the Islamic Maghreb. We've seen the northern part of Mali taken over by Al-Qaeda. And that part of Mali, just that part, is as big as the state of Texas. That's how big it is. Uh, you know, it includes Timbuktu. When I was a little boy growing up, my mother thought Timbuktu was just about the farthest place in the world you could go. She often threatened to send me there. Uh, and I, I wish I'd gone. It's a fascinating city. but. You know, the French, the French military is in there. Uh, it's a former French colony. They've had success. Al-Qaeda uh, has not been able to stand against them. But the French right now have 2,500 soldiers in the northern part of Mali. I bet there are more Texas Rangers than there are French soldiers in that area. And they're going to begin withdrawing in a few weeks. Uh, that shows that, that this is not simply a one-time challenge. We've got a real threat there. Uh, when the terrorists took over the natural gas facility in Algeria and killed 43 or more hostages, it got very little attention in this country because it coincided with the inauguration. I happened to be in England, and I can tell you the impact of that attack on that facility was well understood in Europe. It's a very dramatic change. They went after an economic target. What they wanted to do was turn it into a fireball. We're, we're lucky that didn't happen. But they did kill 43 non-Algerian workers at that facility. Um, and, and that is an indication uh, of their continuing determination uh, to strike against Western targets. We can see all over uh, the Middle East uh, as the pastor said, that the Arab Spring has turned very badly wrong. In Egypt, the Muslim Brotherhood, now in control of the largest Arab country, a population of 70 million people, uh, even as we meet here tonight, Mohammed Morsi, the Muslim Brotherhood president, welcoming President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad uh, of Iran. People say, but you know, the Egyptians are largely Sunni, the Iranians are largely Shia, they'll never get together. Uh, it, it's well worth recalling a Middle Eastern proverb, I against my brother, my brother and I against our cousin, all of us against the foreigner. So uh, they have their differences, they certainly have their differences over Syria, but the fact of, the, of these two presidents meeting is a chilling indication that, uh, that the radicals uh, are still on the rise and that the terrorist uh, threat of al-Qaeda is not the only threat we face in the region. Even in Tunisia, the place where the Arab Spring began and where people have talked about a moderate Islamicist regime in power, this morning, the leader of the main secular opposition party was assassinated. So you can see, uh, you can see the disorder spreading. In Syria, 
the UN estimates 60,000 or more civilians have been killed in this civil war. Yemen has come apart as a country. In Egypt, uh, over 100,000 Coptic Christians have fled the country. The Coptics are 10% of the Egyptian population. They are the original Christian population. They go back to the time of Christ. 100,000 have left the country because they fear what the Muslim Brotherhood will do. This is not idle speculation about what Sharia law means. This is their determination that the country is not a safe place for them to live. And in uh, considering the threat that Al-Qaeda, the Muslim Brotherhood, the whole wave of uh, anti-Western feeling poses, Israel itself uh, is challenged, I think, is in a more dangerous position than it's been since the 1967 war. Friendly Arab states are at risk as well. Uh, and then we come, not just to the threat of terrorism, uh, but to the Iranian nuclear weapons program. Uh, which the Iranian regime has pursued for 20 years. They have uh, built a very broad and deep nuclear infrastructure. They're not racing to build their first nuclear weapon, although they could build it uh, within a matter of months given where they are now. They're not afraid uh, of an American strike against the nuclear weapons program. They have seen economic sanctions imposed on them. It has had an effect, no doubt about it, on their economy, mostly crimping the Iranian middle class, which, by the way, is the element of Iranian society most opposed to the Ayatollahs. So our brilliant sanctions policy has hurt the main people opposed to the regime. It has not hurt the nuclear program at all. And there's every indication that even the sanctions we have in place will be weakened. Today, uh, the highest court in the European Union struck down sanctions the Europeans imposed against the second biggest bank in Iran because they said they didn't have enough evidence that they were involved in the Iranian nuclear weapons program. You know, judges doing our foreign policy for us, that's a great idea. Uh, the fact is that Iran is very close to achieving that objective. Uh, and indeed, the most likely outcome is that, um, uh, that they will get nuclear weapons. Now, you may have seen Senator Hagel's uh, confirmation hearing last week where he was asked uh, about, is it the policy of the administ administration to contain a nuclear Iran? And there are two answers to that question. Yes, that's the policy. No, we don't have a policy. Uh, the, the, the three possibilities, he got two, the two wrong answers. Uh, and I think, I think he was, uh, in fairness to Senator Hegel, I think he was just confused by the briefing. I don't think today's policy is containment. I think that's tomorrow's policy after today's policy fails and they get nuclear weapons. Now, I don't um, believe that, that a containment policy against Iran would work as containment worked against the Soviet Union in the Cold War because the calculus, the mental calculus of the Ayatollahs is very different from that of the communists in Moscow. You can say what you want about them, but they were atheists. They thought they were only going to go around once in life. They weren't about to throw it away too quickly. That's not the view of the regime in Tehran. As Bernard Lewis, the great uh, 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 Middle Eastern scholar said, you know, if, you, if you're eager to get to the afterlife, being told that, uh, that there will be retaliation against you, fearsome retaliation if you use nuclear weapons, is not a deterrent against you using the weapons, it's an incentive. And that, I think, is the mindset that we face uh, in, uh, in Tehran, that relying on religious fanatics to have the same uh, standard of rationality as Western decision makers doesn't give me a lot of confidence going forward that we'll have a stable balance of deterrence. But even if I'm completely wrong about that, even if a nuclear Iran could be contained and deterred, it doesn't stop with Iran. If Iran gets nuclear weapons, even uh, Hillary Clinton, when she was Secretary of State, said Saudi Arabia will get nuclear weapons, Egypt will get nuclear weapons, Turkey will, and perhaps others. So that in the already volatile Middle East, you could have 
in a relatively short period of time as these things go, half a dozen nuclear weapon states. Uh, and, and that is uh, so uh, unstable that it should worry all of us, not just on behalf of Israel, but on our own behalf as well. Because an Iran with nuclear weapons or others uh, is not just a threat in the region, it's a global threat. As is, by the way, North Korea, which may be on the verge of its third nuclear test, one of the poorest countries in the world, more heavily sanctioned than any other country on the planet, an impoverished population that's already had two nuclear tests and a couple of months ago put a payload into Earth orbit. So this is the, this is the reason why uh, our options in the Middle East are narrowing so quickly. Uh, and I think they're down to two. And it's very unattractive. It didn't have to be this way, but I think this is where we are. Uh, the, as I said before, the most likely outcome is that Iran will get nuclear weapons. And although our administration says, uh, uh, they get their card out and they say, let's see, all options are on the table. Nobody <laughs> believes that. The Iranians certainly don't believe it. And that's why the spotlight is on Israel, which twice before in its history has struck against hostile powers in its region that were building nuclear weapons. First against Iraq against Saddam Hussein in 1981 when Israel destroyed the Osirak reactor outside of Baghdad, and more recently in September of 2007 when the Israelis destroyed a reactor in Syria. Interesting uh, about that reactor, who was building the reactor in Syria? North Koreans. North Koreans. They were building a clone of their reactor at Yongbyon. Now, why were the North Koreans in Syria? Uh, not their common border, that's for sure. Not their long cultural association, that's for sure. Somebody was paying them. Probably not Syria, which is not a wealthy country. Probably Iran. Because both Iran and North Korea have an incentive to hide their illicit nuclear activities from international prying. And where better to hide it than in a country where nobody was looking, except fortunately the Israelis were. So we're down to a very difficult and unpleasant uh, choice there, but it's one that uh, proliferators all over the world are watching, because if North Korea can continue with its nuclear weapons program and Iran uh, can cross the nuclear finish line, it's a statement to everybody that the United States lacks the will to stop you. And once people learn that lesson, the incentive to proliferate becomes overwhelming. That's what proliferation is. Each new country that gets the nuclear capability inspires others to do the same. And so from a, uh, the time of uh, the Cold War under Reagan, where we had a bipolar nuclear standoff, uh, we risk very shortly being in a world where perhaps dozens of countries have nuclear weapons. Uh, and that's something that cannot be uh, in our interest. So I think this is a critical time, even though we've just been through an election. It is very important for Americans to remember again what Ronald Reagan's uh, lesson was. It was not uh, the notion that the United States would use its power to throw its weight around. That's never been our foreign policy. We are the least uh, imperialistic great power in the history of the world. All we want to do is be left alone to trade and have uh, commerce with our friends around the world. We're forced, in effect, to help protect this international order because so many others threaten it. But if we fail at our basic obligation to have a strong enough American capability uh, to protect our interest around the world, inevitably the threats to those interests will grow and our ability to preserve a peaceful world will decline. That's what Reagan understood, that peace through strength is a way to maximize the chances to avoid hostilities while protecting American interests, not a way to look for more. Uh, and I think that that still is the overwhelming view of, uh, of uh, the American people. I regret we haven't talked more about national security in the last four years uh, because we've kind of lost the bubble on it in many respects. But uh, it's never too late to learn, especially as we look 
forward here where we see the terrorist threat continuing to grow, the risk of nuclear proliferation growing, uh, the potential of chemical or biological weapons being used by terrorists around the world. It remains a very dangerous place and without a strong America, it will only get more dangerous. So to me, this is a time uh, not just to look back at Ronald Reagan, but to look forward and to say, how would he handle these problems in the future? And I think if we follow uh, the course he laid out for us philosophically, we'll be safe looking ahead. Thank you very much. So we have time for questions, and do I understand you have microphones, or should... Oh, Ambassador, you said that Obama has done, uh, has gone beyond being just um, an American president, that he has larger things in mind. Can you elaborate on that statement? Well, you know, if you look at what he has said repeatedly about his view of uh, the allocation of responsibility for, uh, for issues that have been deemed previously central to American security. Uh, I think we risk more and more having uh, others uh, step in to, uh, to, to perform functions that we should have performed. And I think this is true, or we, it risks being true, not just in uh, matters traditionally associated with national security, but many issues that until now we have considered matters of domestic policy. For every domestic issue that we find important, there are people out there who want to resolve it through international treaties. And uh, I mean, I could go down a long list, take gun control. Um, you know, uh, th this is a matter we debate in democratic, uh, uh, conditions here in this country at the federal, state, and local level. We're obviously having a debate about gun control now, and we'll decide whatever we decide uh, uh, in, the, in the course of that debate. And it'll be open, everybody can participate in it, everybody can express their views, and ultimately the majority will uh, prevail. That's, that's the way it should be. But for years, people who have been dissatisfied with gun control legislation in this country have been trying to negotiate an international arms trade treaty that would, in effect, control what we do domestically. Um, and we confronted this in 2001 in the Bush administration when these negotiations were really rolling along. I went to New York. Uh, and gave a speech for the U.S. where I said, we're not prepared to agree to any international treaty which, if it were enacted as positive law in the United States, would violate the Second Amendment. Well, you thought I'd said something... You'd think I'd said something really outrageous, uh, because that was the whole point of the negotiation, that they would negotiate a treaty, bring it back to the Senate, uh, they'd say, 150 other countries have ratified this treaty. How can we not? The Senate wouldn't have paid enough attention to it, and even though it requires two-thirds to be ratified, they'd get it through saying, you know, it doesn't really affect domestic statutes until after it's ratified, when suddenly, right there in Section 3, you'd find that we're required to do this, and Section 4 would require us to do that and suddenly it would be taken out of our hands. This has been true on a whole range of other issues, on environmental matters, uh, through the Kyoto Protocol, or what they were trying to negotiate at Copenhagen. Uh, you know, if you, if you uh, adhere to uh, United Nations resolutions, we shouldn't have the death penalty in this country, because successive United Nations votes have decided that it's, uh, it's cruel and inhumane punishment. Now, look, people are entitled to their views on the death penalty, on climate change, on gun control, on abortion, on any, any issue. We debate it in a democratic constitutional society. What I object to is people saying we're going to take those issues into an international forum and decide them. And I think, uh, I was surprised, frankly, that in Obama's first term, we didn't see more of that. I think he felt 
constrained by the 2012 election. That's over. Uh, and now we'll see what he does uh, in his second term. This, to me, is a matter of fundamental sovereignty. That we are, we understand sovereignty in this country in a way that, that, that most other countries don't. It's in our Constitution. It's in the first three words. It says, we the people. We are sovereign here. We make up uh, our own mind on these questions. And the United States, <laughs> un unlike many other countries, uh, for Americans, there is no higher authority on earth no higher authority on earth than our Constitution, period, close quote. Thank you very much for being here. I think if uh, President Reagan were here, he would approve. Uh, I, I have a couple questions. You actually just started down that path. I was going to ask you about the, the United Nations in light of the threats out there that we face as, as a world and the U.S. having been kind of the force for stability throughout the world for you know, for, for generations, uh, the UN seems to be sort of not on the same path as we are. So there's a lot of issues with vetoes in the Security Council, and we really can't get some of the things that we'd like to do through the UN. What do you see as the legitimate role of, of the UN today in terms of benefiting the world? Uh, yeah, well, I, I, I saw a lot of my job in New York as being damage control. Of, of trying to avoid small problems getting to be bigger problems. I think the UN is a vast, sprawling enterprise. That's part of its problem. It tries to do too much. There are elements of the UN system that do good work, but its political decision-making mechanisms are essentially broken. And people have talked about various reforms that could be adopted. Uh, there's great frustration uh, among the American people. Many want to withdraw. I would propose one single reform that I think would make a huge difference. Most UN agencies today are funded by what are called assessed contributions, in effect mandatory uh, uh, contributions. The U.S. pays 22 percent of most UN budgets, 27 percent of peacekeeping. That's our assessment. Um, I would make one change. I would end the system of assessed contributions. I'd make all contributions entirely voluntary so that we decide, and we would operate under a very simple principle. We would pay only for what we want and insist that we get what we pay for. How's that for a revolutionary principle? <laughs> That would be like a tsunami through the UN system. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Thank you for coming to Loudoun County. Um, you're, you've been so nice this evening. I really don't understand the snarky comments about your demeanor. But um, so my question, and it's so timely that you're here today. Yesterday, I guess it was revealed that the Obama administration uh, wanted to expand their uh, drone strike capability uh, to be able to take out American citizens that were suspected of terrorism overseas. And on the way home from work today, I heard that you thought that was a legitimate expansion. Um, you know, some of us think that it's total hypocrisy on the part of the administration, but I wanted to get your comment. Well, it is total hypocrisy on the part of the administration, but, but it really doesn't reflect uh, uh, a, a substantial change from what the Bush administration uh, did. And I know uh, people are concerned about the implications of, of, uh, uh, of the policy, but, but I think it needs to be understood this way. Uh, you have to, the, the, the first thing you have to do in looking at the war on terror is deciding whether you think it is more like domestic criminal activity on the one hand or war on the other. Uh, not war between states, uh, as we've understood it in the international sense, but, but a form of, uh, of guerrilla warfare directed against not armed combatants but against innocent civilians. Uh, I think it's clear, and I think we understood immediately after the first 9-11 that we had been attacked and that it was an act of war and that the response had to be uh, in, in the war paradigm, not in the law enforcement paradigm. Th this is not sort of like uh, knocking off the 7-Eleven down at the street corner. Uh, you don't handle it the same way. It's not about breaking laws in a constitutionally protected civil society um, where uh, we have historically insisted on due process 
protections for uh, the accused and, and fundamental civil liberties. Th this is war against America. And if uh, it's taken up by Americans uh, who join Al-Qaeda, uh, they have become enemy combatants. Um, and that is, uh, uh, that, that, that means that they're not entitled to have their Miranda rights read to them. Uh, they're not entitled to the protections that the guy who knocked over the 7-Eleven would get. Uh, and we, we followed that pattern historically. Uh, we killed tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of soldiers in the Confederate Army because they had rebelled against the country. They had taken up arms against it. They, they had engaged in war. None of them got hearings because they weren't uh, committing crimes in a civil society sense. They were engaged in an act of war. And the limit on uh, what the government can do in waging war is the Congress. If, if the Congress doesn't want this to happen, then it should rescind or repeal the authorization to use military force that was passed in the days after the 9-11 attack. Uh, you know, the terrorists, and, uh, the terrorists have used our uh, civilization and our humanity against us. We have tried for hundreds of years in the West to protect innocent civilians from combat. We, we, we've, we've had our failures, but we've tried over and over again to do that. The terrorists attack civilians, and they hide among civilians. Uh, and, and then they argue that you've got to follow your laws of civil society, and we can do whatever we want. Now, I'm not arguing we follow their path. We follow not the law enforcement paradigm, but the law of war paradigm. And we follow our morality, and we follow our uh, philosophy about what the law of war involves. And our troops are indoctrinated in that, and when they violate our war of law paradigm, they're disciplined. Uh, so I think what we're doing here is uh, is entirely appropriate, and uh, it's uh, like everything else in this country, it's a matter for political debate, and the fact we can debate it uh, means that uh, there is a check on the executive. We've used this power against Americans uh, very infrequently, against people who were planning or carrying out violence that would do what? That would kill innocent civilians in this country. They didn't get read their rights, uh, nobody on 9-11 got read their rights when they died. Uh, and, and, uh, and so I'm, I'm comfortable with this policy. Not that it's, it was original to the Obama administration. The roots of it come right after 9-11 when Bush administration officials looked at exactly these issues and came to uh, essentially the same conclusions. We take maybe one or, one or two more here, if that's OK. Ambassador, uh, intimidating them, relieving them of uh, their jobs, and uh, sending a message of intimidation throughout the office of corps that is part and parcel of Benghazi. Yeah. Well, on, on Benghazi, um, you know, I've, I've actually uh, I've talked to Congressman Wolf about his idea to set up a select committee in the House uh, that can that can uh, that cover all the stovepipes of intelligence, uh, armed services, foreign affairs, and not let the uh, not let things slip between the cracks. You know, these these two hearings were were missed opportunities. Uh, it would help if our members of Congress would ask questions instead of making statements because that allows the witness to make a statement back. Believe me, I've been there. I know how this works. Um, and and there's, there's still a huge amount about what happened on that day and what happened before that day that uh, we don't know the answers to and for which there are no good answers. I do not buy the argument that uh, the decision to reject the request for enhanced security that were coming from our embassy in Tripoli before September the 11th were just handled by uh, by mid-level bureaucrats and that uh, it, wasn't, uh, it wasn't a matter of concern. You know, Libya was a very dangerous place and all the information coming in was that it was getting more dangerous. Uh, secretaries of state I worked for would worry about the safety of their personnel and if people weren't paying attention to it, they weren't doing their job. Um, and uh, it's, you know, this was supposed to be a triumph of the administration's lead from behind policy. So not paying attention to what was going on is just inexcusable. Um, 
Uh, and 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 that's I just I'd like to know more about that. And uh, you know, Secretary Clinton testified she didn't know anything about the request for enhanced security. I, I am stunned by that. I'm stunned by that. Um, we, we don't. We still don't know what happened on 9/11 uh, in the attack itself. I would just ask basic questions like, we know when the attack began because that's established in the record. So, Secretary Clinton, when did you first learn of the attack? When did you first learn of the attack? And what was the first thing you did after you learned of it? When did you speak to the president for the first time? Did you call him or did he call you? Did you go to the White House? Did you talk to the Secretary of Defense? I'd like to know what she did. In any administration I've been in, it would have been all hands on deck. They'd have been in the Situation Room doing whatever they could to protect the Americans in Benghazi and to protect against the possibility that, that the attack there was only the beginning and that more attacks were coming. And in fact, we narrowly avoided, I think, some real tragedies in Tunisia. Uh, the the uh, people attacked our embassy. Uh, they couldn't get into the compound. They went to an international school across the street, which fortunately the principal had dismissed all the students a few hours before. You can only imagine what might have happened if the students had still been there. But, but there's no evidence that, um, that there was any sense of urgency. Uh, among senior administration officials on 9-11. Now, Secretary Panetta is going to testify tomorrow. I'll be very interested to see what he has to say. I hope people ask him questions like the ones I just posed. It's really, it's not hard to do. Um, and, and we need some answers. And finally, we need answers about where the story came from that this was provoked entirely by this famous Mohammed video, uh, for which there's simply no evidence. And there wasn't any evidence that day. The, Security people in Benghazi knew uh, as it was happening that there was no demonstration that got out of control. This was a terrorist attack. There's no doubt about it. Uh, and I think if we could begin to get some, uh, some specifics, th then we would be in a position uh, to try and see what to do to protect not only official Americans in the Middle East, but private citizens who are over there doing business, uh, engaged in tourism, visiting family who are in many respects more vulnerable to being kidnapped and used as hostages than the official Americans who at least have some, have some protection. We'll take maybe one more if that's okay. Ambassador Bolton, uh, thank you very much for coming here tonight. Um, I'm a Act for America leader here in Virginia. My question concerns uh, the organization of the Islamic Cooperation, which I'm sure you're familiar with, is going on at the UN. Would you comment uh, on that organization and what they're trying to do with Defamation of religions and everything that would affect people here in this country. Yeah, th this is a very serious problem. Uh, it's it's certainly more serious at the moment in Europe than it is here, but it's growing here as well. Uh, to make comments that are deemed uh, derogatory to religion uh, impermissible. And I was at the UN when the famous episode of the Danish cartoons took place. And these were satirical cartoons about the prophet uh, Mohammed and uh, stirred up by uh, radical religious leaders. There were riots uh, around the Middle East. And I remember uh, the ambassador from Pakistan uh, came with a proposal for a resolution that would condemn remarks that were uh, derogatory about religion. And uh, I just, uh, I mean, politely, because actually I do speak politely, I said, we're not going to consider any resolution like that. It would violate our First Amendment. And, uh, you know, we've had a long history of, uh, 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 in, in, uh, in America and the United States, of freeing ourselves from restrictions on what we can say. You know, uh, John Milton, the great poet, uh, was always in trouble uh, in his day for saying things that violated uh, the, the, the views of the leaders of the Church of England. He, he believed in divorce, for example, and, and, and this was a huge fight uh, because to advocate divorce was deemed an attack on the church. If you, can, if you can prescribe speech that's offensive to other people, you can limit the, uh, the, the debate we can have in our country uh, and, and limit uh, the range of 
uh, of what it's permissible to speak on. And I just find that illegitimate. I take a very broad view of the Second Amendment. I take a very broad view of the First Amendment. I believe in individual freedom. I don't believe in restricting what people can say. And, and I think it is divisive of society to say that some people are protected and other people are not. Uh, and, that, and that there's some zone carved out for this religion or that religion. To me, it doesn't matter what the religion is. We, we are one people under one rule of law and not a, a society that's divided into uh, stovepipes. Uh, and the effort to do that uh, under the guise of multiculturalism or whatever you want to call it, I think is ultimately destructive. Uh, I think we're at risk of forgetting uh, one of the aspects of American exceptionalism, that we come from very diverse places around the, uh, the world, but we all end up as Americans. And people who are not willing to do that uh, you know, that's, that, that, that they're, they're entitled to be somewhere else. That, that's what e pluribus unum means, means out of, it means out of many, one. And it was stunning a few years ago, Al Gore, who, who else, said, never forget our famous motto, e pluribus unum, out of one, many. I mean, he got it exactly wrong. <laughs> So we know he flunked Latin in uh, high school, but he also flunked basic American philosophy because it's precisely the Americanization of diverse populations and, and our uh, all being subjected to the same law that is so important to making us as strong as a country and, and why we need to reject uh, the idea that, uh, that defaming religion um, that prohibiting the defamation of religion uh, is somehow an expression of religious tolerance. It is not. It is an expression of intolerance and a lack of faith in the basic common sense of the American people to understand uh, the broad terms of the debate. So, I mean, I, I come out in favor of freedom. Whenever there's a close question, to me, there's an easy answer. And I think that's Ronald Reagan's answer, too. Thank you very much.